Hey, welcome everyone. I see that people are kind of trickling in, um, so I'll give you guys a chance to to get into the chat and say hi. Um, my name is Emily. I work for Working Washington, um, and it's really cool to see all of you joining us. Um, so as you're joining, if you could just type in the chat and let us know uh, your name and what apps you work for and where you're from. Um, and if you want to also let us know, you know, what made you decide that you want to get involved in the fight for gig workers' rights, it would be great to hear that from you guys too. Awesome. So I'm seeing lots of Instacart, Rev.com, Uber Eats, DoorDash. Definitely been hearing from a lot of DoorDash workers. Oh, DoorDash and Rover. That's interesting. Cool. Okay, great. Um, so for those of you who didn't hear earlier, my name's Emily. I work for Working Washington, the workers' rights organization. Um, and we have been working alongside Instacart workers for the last couple of months to organize um, in the wake of some pretty huge pay cuts on Instacart. Um, and as a sort of result of, of that work, we've now found ourselves in this position where there's a lot of gig workers who are speaking out about issues with pay and with transparency in the gig economy. Um, and there's a real opportunity here to make some pretty serious changes. Um, in the way that the gig economy operates. Um, so it's super exciting to see a bunch of you here ready to get on board with that cause and help make those changes. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, if you didn't hear me before, please go ahead and share in the chat and let us know your name, um, where you're from, what apps you work on, and why you want to help fight for gig workers' rights. I would love to hear that from you guys. Um, so just to let you know a little bit about how this call is going to go, um, there's a bunch of workers and um, other people who are going to be sharing some updates um, and some ideas and some questions um, on video. And then you guys will all be able to interact on the chat. We're going to have Sarah and Vanessa, who are two Instacart workers who have been leaders on this campaign, talking to you guys in the chat. Um, and then there's also a Q&A feature that you can use. So if you hit that Q&A button, you can ask questions during the meeting. Um, and Sarah or Vanessa or my boss Sage, who's also on the call, will answer your question. Um, so one of the things that's really cool and also uh, really challenging about holding these kinds of meetings is that there's so many of you who want to be involved that it's actually hard to have everyone on video. Um, so we really want to have you know more opportunities in the future for us to all be on video and all be talking together. Um, one thing that we were thinking about doing was holding sort of a follow-up Q&A meeting where we could all be on video um, and we could have like a more in-depth conversation about sort of like policy details about what we're working on with the pay-up campaign. Um, so I would like to know from you guys just whether you'd be interested in something like that. Um, so you can just take the poll and then if you guys are interested in doing a, a smaller sort of like video call later on, we can set that up in a few weeks. Um, so. I'm going to give some background really quick on, on what happened and how we got to the place that we're at right now. So in early January, um, Mia, who's an Instacart worker who has been organizing with Working Washington for some time, um, let us know that a lot of Instacart workers were talking about some really serious pay cuts on their app and about how Instacart was taking tips and factoring those into pay, uh, and that this was a huge problem. Um, we started reaching out to Instacart workers, and Instacart workers organized really, really quickly and in a really profound way, and actually got Instacart to cave and change their pay policies. But the more conversations we had about this, the more we were like, the way they changed their policies really isn't enough. It doesn't get us enough money. It's still not transparent. We still don't really know why we're getting paid what we're getting paid, um, and that's still a really big problem. Um, so now we're bringing gig workers from all different kinds of apps together around um, the idea that we really need to create outside accountability for these companies. It's not enough to just speak out when they're doing something wrong and get them to change it. 
we actually need laws that hold them accountable and we're going to be fighting for those laws. Um, so most of you probably already know these, but the three laws that we're going to be fighting for, or the three policies we're going to be fighting for are a pay floor of at least the equivalent of $15 an hour plus expenses, um, as well as tips being on top of that, always never factored into pay, and transparency from the company. Um, and as we, uh, as we hear from people on the call today, we're going to be digging into what those things could look like as actual policy. There's a ton of details to be worked out, um, and there's a ton of work that we need to do to get there. But we're going to be hearing about you know, a few specific updates on specific apps that we've been doing some organizing work on. We're going to be digging in those, into those demands a little bit more, talking about what steps we need to take to get there. Um, and then uh, we'll have a few uh, actions that you guys can do after the meeting that we'll share with you too. Um, so, oh, one thing to know really quickly is I think that on Zoom, your, your chat might be set by default to send to all panelists rather than all panelists and attendees. So if you want to talk to the entire group, everyone who's on the call, you need to change it to all panelists and attendees so that everyone here can see what you have to say. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Kaylana. A lot of you might know Kaylana as the blessed driver on YouTube. She runs an amazing YouTube channel about gig work. Um, and Kaylana has been in the gig economy since 2010. Um, and she's worked on DoorDash, Uber Eats, Instacart, Grubhub, Postmates, Handy, Uber. She's done it all. And she knows a ton about what's going on in these various apps. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about that. So take it away, Kaylana. Oh, Kaylana, it looks like you're still on mute. You might need to. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, Thank you, everybody. I'm so glad to be here today. And so, yeah, uh, what Emily just said is kind of like what I've been doing. And I initially started uh, with a company called Homejoy, um, and it was a cleaning service. But now I don't think they're in business anymore. But um, yeah, and then I eventually started to do uh, delivery driving um, in 2010, I believe. And then um, I kind of ventured off into rideshare with Uber and Lyft. And then eventually I went on to doing Instacart, and I started to do Instacart full time for a while. And um, and so, you know, I'm a single mom. And so like, I had to find something that was really sustainable at that time. And so, and then the pace started to change. And, um, but, you know, I started blogging and I did like, you know, little web stuff here and there, but then I guess it became like a brand for me. And I, I kind of stuck with that. And my main thing is I just wanted to kind of just blog about my experiences, but it kind of turned into something much more bigger than that, because I like to be honest about everything. And I know a lot of people talk about just, uh, the apps and how much money you can make, but I like to be real about everything as a whole. And so, uh, yeah. And so, um, a lot has changed with Instacart and, and not for us just to focus so much on just Instacart itself, but all of the apps as a whole. And I think some of these, uh, companies don't realize that this is actual work. It's not just only a gig, even though it's still part of the gig economy, but this is work for people. Um, you know, and people are actually making a living from this. And this is very important for people to um, have something that they can fall back on, but also that these companies need to be honest in what they're really doing with the pay structure. And a lot of people can't live off of not only minimum wage, but also with some of the pay that they're giving us, you know, making, you know, a $7 for a very large batch, you know, from Instacart with like 64 items is totally like ridiculous, you know, um, and even um, DoorDash, a lot has changed with them. And I know initially when I started with them, like, you know, I, the money was great and it still was pretty decent, but I just find like some of these apps now, things have changed to where you have to work a lot more harder to be able to make a decent amount of income. And my thing is, you know, um, I feel like, okay, well, where's, where's the money going? Oh, my, my screen. I'm sorry, you guys. Like, um, there's like a poll thing that keeps popping up, but yeah. Um, so things have changed a lot with, with like some of these apps and especially with DoorDash. Like I really like DoorDash a lot. Um, and I really enjoyed Instacart for a long period of time, but how they changed the structure and the pay, it, it, it got kind of bad. And so, um, but yeah, DoorDash has a lot of, uh, great qualities about itself. But at the same time, um, six dollars sometimes driving long distance for an order can be kind of kind of crazy. And I'm I'm also noticing that our tips have been missing. Uh, we at first, okay, we saw the tips are great, and now it's like, uh, how do we know exactly where the money is going? And so um, I know that Working Washington is working on a lot of things with uh, with 
with the structure and how they're actually presenting the information to, um, you know, for, you know, for the workers and things like that. And so, which I find is very, very great. Um, and I know it's very important for all of us to get together as, as gig workers and to be able to, you know, voice our concern about what's really going on and, you know, also have local chapters here, um, you know, in different states to come together and try to um, hold these companies accountable to what they're doing, you know, um, and, and, and I think some people don't look at gig work as just, you know, as actual work, but my thing is, if you're getting paid, and you're paying your taxes, that's work, you know, and there are a lot of people that work on these platforms that do this for a living, and they make way more money than someone that's working a nine to five. And so I think this is very important for everybody that is able to, or that feels led to, to, to come together, especially if they want to see change. And so um, I think working in Washington is really great. Um, I'm glad that somebody was able, like Emily is able to take a stand and we all come together as a team to, uh, you know, to um, see change. And so, um, but as far as uh, DoorDash goes, um, I know that uh, the company like, working in Washington was actually working on uh, putting together like, like some metrics and some data to show exactly where the money is going, um, how much each worker should get paid. And I think that's very good. It's not just DoorDash, there's other apps as well. I'm even noticing a change in Uber Eats as well. And so, um, and I noticed that the company, you know, uh, well, that company, but uh, working in Washington is actually putting together um, some things and trying to get input from different uh, gig workers to see, okay, what exactly are you guys getting paid? How are things changing? Um, you know, um, are you guys getting stiffed? Like, what, what have you noticed? Um, and how are you being treated as well? And it's not just so much to pay. Sometimes it's how we're getting treated and how there's lack of support, even from customer support from these companies. And so um, I hope that, that was like um, helpful to you guys. And, and so um, I guess I should pass it on to uh, Matthew. Actually, before you do that, I want to dig in really quickly to just a few of the specific um, updates that you were mentioning. So yeah. a, a lot of you who are on this call um, submitted data to us about Instacart's pay, um, and that has been really huge. We actually got uh, 679 submissions of weekly earnings from you guys, from Instacart workers, um, and we got 3,000 submissions of individual jobs. Um, we're going to be releasing that data publicly really soon, but since you guys are on the call, just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, the basic findings that we've seen um, and give you sort of like a sneak peek into those. Um, so the first finding was that tips made up about a third of people's pay on average, which means the amount that Instacart is paying you compared to your gross pay is pretty low. Um, we also found out that when we backed out expenses and tips and looked at what Instacart was really paying after you took your expenses out, um, people were making substantially less than $15, um, which is what Instacart says people are making. Um, and in a lot of cases, people were actually making below the minimum wage. Um, and one of the expenses that was really high that we found was the cost from driving from your current location to the store where you were shopping. Um, and that's an expense that I think a lot of people don't think about and that actually ended up really impacting people's overall pay. Um, and then on DoorDash, you know, we're seeing a lot of pressure growing against DoorDash because they do the same thing that Instacart did. They, they take tips from customers and factor those into what they're paying workers. Um, and we've actually built a calculator for DoorDash workers to use to figure out how much DoorDash is really paying them. Um, so you type in the information that DoorDash gives you, and then it shows you what that really comes out to when you factor in expenses and take out the tips that really should be on top of your work. Um, and then we've also heard that DoorDash is running these roundtable sessions with DoorDashers. So I'm very curious to know if any of you on the call work for DoorDash and if you've heard about these roundtables or if you've been invited to one, um, it seems like they're just selecting a few people for them. So if you are a DoorDash worker and you've heard anything about it, let us know in the chat or reach out to us after the meeting. It would be great to hear. Um, Joseph asked, are you still collecting pay data for Instacart drivers? We're not collecting weekly pay earnings anymore, but we do still have the calculator you can use, and you can use that to submit jobs to us so we can keep an eye on how much they're paying per job. Um, so that's all the little sort of like app updates we have, and now I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Matthew. Thanks, Emily. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? All right, guys. Hey, thanks, uh, Emily and uh, Kelania. All extremely important information uh, as we continue to evolve from uh, taking on one platform to the entire gig model as a whole. 
uh, since we have pretty much checked all the boxes fighting Instacart as a ragtag group of shoppers with very limited resources, winning many real and symbolic battles along the way, there's no better time to unite behind uh, these universal messages of fair work and fair play. Uh, no better time to go bigger and join forces with other gig workers and lawmakers. It's not a new battle. Uh, it's a, old as the employment itself. The difference is we have the luxury of learning from those historical examples. You know, striking, ganging up on the company on Twitter is really fun and it helps get the messages out there. Um, but we've grown beyond that. Uh, the issues are much larger, systemic, and require true change to secure our right to a fair wage. Some of us, like myself, have been in these trenches for years working with, you know, a few dozen, uh, you know, strong people that want change. And we've certainly had our fair share of tricks uh, pushed in our faces when we thought we've won. Um, whenever we seem to win an issue, several more are created. It's because the gig economies have zero accountability to us or current laws and regulations and spend millions of dollars a year lobbying to prevent that from happening. So we have to lobby back. Uh, there are ears listening from Representative Jayapal to Senator Khanna to customers and teams of industry watchdogs, journalists, scholars, and yes, policy writers. So we're now in the stages of reaching out to these people and currently working with many to get our fight out in the open. Um, we only have three reasonable requests. And as you can see on the Action Network website and the new cool payup.wtf uh, site, we're asking that you stand with us uh, and demand these three items become a reality. Uh, first, as mentioned, it's a pay floor of $15, but plus our expenses. Compared to data we've all provided, as was just mentioned, you know, 3,000 submissions, hundreds of others, um, it would be a raise in the existing floors of 5 to $7 in most markets right off the bat, not to mention the $1 that DoorDash is still kicking in on their deliveries. And it doesn't mean the current structures have to drastically change either. Instacart used to use a model just like this for various markets, utilizing um, the hourly guarantee, which a lot of you were uh, able to utilize, and it um, essentially allows you to make a set value per available hours. Uh, and if they can plow through millions of dollars trying to get this machine learning algorithm up and working, they can figure that one out. And uh, some other things that are going to be specifically touched on later in the call. Uh, but for now, utilize the chat. Let us know how much do you guys think you're making per hour in a week if you weren't to count your tips and added your true expenses. Personally, I am going to hit about 8,000 miles this year. Just did an oil change. I read a story about someone just yesterday who had to spend $1,000 replacing wheels and, and, you know, shocks for all the heavy, you know, orders we have to do. Um, so most of us probably aren't going to come close to $15. Um, and this would definitely help. It would help set that safety net for us uh, in order to be paid what we're worth. And, you know, coupled with that, you know, this doesn't come just out of nowhere. A few years back, working in Washington and the city of Seattle kind of rallied behind a fight for 15 um, for, you know, McDonald's uh, and, you know, fast food workers. And it actually, you know, worked and was able to be kind of replicated around the country and it's picking up steam. You know, uh, Amazon comes to mind, but like I mentioned, uh, they're always using some trickery. So the implementation of that didn't really hit expectations. So we really have to keep an eye on these things and get the policy set that's going to actually protect us. And all we have to do is show up, use our voices, make sure that we're all aligned with goals like these. And if we all continue to spread the word amongst our local zones, find our local representatives, we'll be able to replicate this process at a local level and then eventually spreading to state and eventual national protections for all gig workers. The next item, number two, is so simple, it's almost depressing that we have to fight for it. Uh, but tips should always be extra. They just absolutely should. Um, it, it should be a transaction between just us and the customer. And it shouldn't be factored into a black box algorithm nor have any effect on future offered work, also known as throttling, or uh, you know, just benching you for the day because they feel you've made too much money that day. The third demand we have is for true transparency without the spin. Gig companies love to spin absolutely everything they'll tell you. Uh, as a contractor, we're required to have all relevant information necessary to complete the offered job, the true mileage, not as a crow flies. I see a lot of people posting pictures of having to take ferries and going over bodies of water. It's just not realistic want the actual items and units, the, the payments to be clear, and the actual delivery windows that our customers want. Uh, no manipulations of customer and contractor app screens that only serve to increase profits for billion dollar companies and shake down customers and contractors alike. So we're gonna be digging into all these things in the coming weeks and months as the momentum builds for this movement. 
We're actually looking for you to supply the input as you have been, just keep it up. Uh, we need to hear from everyone as these policies are put to paper and eventual votes. Uh, and you don't have to wait for us. You know, we're doing a lot here, but you guys can also start organizing locally. We have a lot of people from different platforms here. And that's awesome. That means it's not just Instacart anymore. And it's not just Uber drivers in New York and LA. Um, so start locally. Um, and with the support of us working Washington, you know, we can then more efficiently replicate these processes as they spread and eventually meet up at the national level. Um, and it'll just be easier for everybody. So a good amount of work is already being done specifically in Seattle, LA, Uber drivers just struck, New York is always doing something. So this model can be used anywhere. And we'll be talking more specifically about some of those questions that have come up uh, around these policies uh, next. Um, but uh, for now, I'm just gonna pass you off to our warrior Mia and she's gonna explain a little bit about her firsthand experience and how engagement can actually provide these real results and get the ball rolling to get some change. So thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Hi, guys. Um, I'm really excited to see everyone coming together. So far, we have over 200 people here. I'm really excited about that. And I know that we have the power to make changes like this happen because I've been a part of it myself. So some of you guys know, last May I injured myself by carrying too much of a heavy load up flights of stairs to an apartment. I had taken a Costco order that consisted of four cases of water, some sundries, and a cheesecake. I had to see my doctor, and when I explained what had happened, she asked me, did I go to l and I? I looked at her with an expression of bewilderment, mostly like, eh? I had double checked with L Labor and Industries, and I found that I wasn't afforded the same rights that any other worker has, even though we paid the same taxes. I was out almost for two weeks, and thankfully, I have another source of income and savings to derive from. I had gotten involved with Working Washington after replying to a question on Facebook on being injured on the job. I was invited to become a part of a panel that would start the conversation with hopes of making changes to current policies that are written. In late January of this year, I testified in front of the state legislator and state committees on my experiences as an independent contractor who works as a full service shopper on the Instacart platform. A bill that would classify and clarify what an independent contractor is. As I spoke, my one goal was to have a heart-to-heart -heart connection with anybody who would listen. I had hoped that my words would somehow touch or even spark a reaction, that somehow my words would garner the help that we needed to change policies for the betterment of us all. I was pleasantly surprised to see a few weeks later that the committee chairwoman, Karen Kaiser, was talking about me on the TV show Inside Olympia. She had presided over a committee that I'd spoken in front of. She, started, she stated that she was writing a bill about the gig economy. She understood that we are now in a new territory and that we, have, that we need a new platform and these platforms would need to involve us. She's currently working on a minimum wage bill for the gig economy workers. It doesn't always feel like we have the power to make changes in our lives, but we do. This is actual proof. If we make our voices heard, to legislators, they will listen. I have said this before and I'll say it again. If we don't speak up, then some corporate exec will make the decisions for our lives. So we, and I'm talking about you and me now, we need to make and come up with some great policies to help us all. After all, our success will reach others and we have to do it the right way. First of all, we need to continue and solidify an outreach plan to reach more shoppers and even more gig work economy workers such as Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, basically everyone. We need a huge number of people on board to make this happen. And every gig worker should have a chance to have their voices heard in this process. People must know that they aren't alone in this. Don't get me wrong, some people don't want us rocking the boat, but it's just simply business. This is numbers for us to stay in the black. This is for the betterment of our families. This is so that we're able to pay our bills without worrying. We are specifically asking for people to help with the development of our three pay up demands into a real policy. We are working with policy experts to do this now, to turn our big ideas into a real policy. We need you to be a part of this process. We need to make sure that we state that we stay on what we want on that policy to be. Our pay up demands are 
as Matthew stated earlier, a $15 an hour pace plus expenses. That tips are not part of the base pay plus separate, that are separate, sorry, and transparency of pay. It also can include clarification of independent contractor status or even portable benefits. Please understand that this is not the part where you complain about the company that you're working for because of a technical issue on your phone. We're talking about actual policies here, okay? So once we have a policy written, we'll contact our local legislators to support our goals. We're thinking national, but we must act locally first so that it becomes a domino effect. We need to make sure that the word is spreading to elected officials and other policymakers across the country to make it easier for us. After all, look at what happened to $15 minimum wage. Now, what if it went statewide instead of city by city? What if it went nationwide? Okay, so although we don't exactly have a, a policy right now, we are in the development stages. We need to communicate these ideas to people who can champion us People like Senator Karen Kaiser and other legislators. We need to find the right local policymakers and the elected officials and ask them if they would help us also. We know that many companies are seeking exemption status on what an independent contractor can look like, especially in California and in New York. We know that companies do not want to pay us a fair wage, any benefits that include healthcare, 401k, or even LNI. This is why we need your help. If you stand up, you stand up not only for yourself, you stand up for the rest of us. If you're interested in helping on with outreach of our fellow, to our fellow gig economy workers or policy development and connecting with your own legislators, please say so in the chat right now. And please put your name on there once again. Our fight is not a local one. This affects everyone here in our nation, yet if we act locally, we'll affect globally. I'd like to introduce you guys to Karina Bull, who works for the Seattle Office of Labor Standards. She will explain how connecting with people in offices like hers can help us and what policy should look like. Ladies and gentlemen, Karina Bull. Hi everyone, I'm so glad to be here with all of you, all 202 of you. Again, my name is Karina Bull. I'm here in sunny Seattle, but actually is sunny here today. I'm joined by my fellow policy team members. I'll bring them in. Uh, Janae and Karam. We are the policy team of a 28 person office. Everything that we do is dedicated to improving worker lives. And so we accomplish that through a variety of ways. We do outreach to business and to workers on our eight labor standards that we have in effect here in Seattle. We do enforcement of those labor standards when we believe there may be a violation. We have a commitment to racial equity and we also do policy development. So we're here today for the policy development piece of it and we recognize that there are problems, many problems facing gig workers. So we are in research mode to try to find out more about that. And to that end, we've had a very informative, enjoyable time meeting with Instacart workers that Working Washington has facilitated meetings for us to meet with them. So we've met Mia, we've met Matthew, Sarah, Kristen, and others. And it's really been insightful to learn from you, the workers, what problems you are experiencing. At the same time, we're also reading books and journal articles and talking with academic researchers and policy think tanks. So we're trying to take as wide a variety as possible. Eventually we will connect with businesses as well. and. Here today, we really, really want to let you know that when Mia and Matthew say that worker voices have an impact and matter, they are correct. And we really are listening to what you are saying and we're thinking about what we can do with the information that you provide us. So here in Seattle is an example of how worker input, community input can translate into actual policies. We do have eight laws on the books here in Seattle that are specifically geared towards workers in addition to discrimination protections as well. And each of these has had a different path towards actually becoming a law, but the common thread in all of them is that it, they were driven from the beginning by community leadership and worker voice. And so we've already heard about the 
fight for minimum wage. It began with fast food strikers. It moved to a campaign for SeaTac, which is an airport town a little bit south of Seattle. And then the then mayor, former mayor of Seattle brought together a group of worker advocates, businesses, community voices to craft our own minimum wage here in Seattle. Now back in 2012, there were only five localities, that cities and counties in the country that had increased minimum wages. Now, just seven short years later, there are 44 localities across the country with an increased minimum wage. Also in 2012, Seattle had one labor standard. It was our paid sick leave law. We had one staff person, that was me. Now we have 28. So if things really do grow, things really do have a ripple effect. So if you're not in Seattle, if you are in Ohio, if you are in Nebraska, if you are in New York, you all can collectively still work towards this larger goal. Emily, did you have specific questions? Yeah, sorry. Um, so we've been hearing from a lot of workers about um, their their thoughts on this stuff. And one thing that's coming up a lot in the chat is sort of this question about like, well, we're independent contractors, so we don't get these uh, these basic rights, right? Um, so I think the question is sort of, you know, is there a way to create laws that could protect independent contractors no matter how they're classified or that could protect workers no matter how they're classified and allow them to still be independent contractors but get access to some basic rights? Yeah, so the short answer is yes. Regardless of whether you're working as a contractor or an employee, there are ways that the law can protect you. And Seattle actually has an example of that. So last year, we became the eighth place in the country to have a domestic worker bill of rights and the first place in the country to have workplace protections that applied to both independent contractors and employees. So for this particular law that's going to go in effect in July, it covers domestic workers, nannies, uh, gardeners, cooks, household managers, uh, house cleaners, and if they're an employee, it covers them. If they're an independent contractor, it covers them. There's no need to do any sort of analysis or think about factors in a test. It applies. And so for that particular law, the workers have a right to a minimum wage or a minimum wage equivalent, which of course in Seattle is higher. It's $15. If they do happen to work for a large employer, it would be as high as $16. There's a right to meal periods and rest breaks. There is a right to a day of rest after six consecutive days of work, and also the right to retain your documents so that, say, if a household were to take a passport, the domestic worker actually would have a right to that. So that's an example of what we call statutory employment, which is a legal term that just means the law requires that as a basic floor, workers get these rights. If they work part-time, full-time, those rights still will apply. Awesome, thanks. Um, and then I was also wondering if you could just talk a little bit about you know, what OLS's process is like with researching these kinds of issues and like what kinds of questions you guys will be asking as you do research into the gig economy. Yeah, so, we are, we're guided by some of the research that we've done that I previously mentioned. We're also guided by the National Pay Up campaign that Working Washington and you have already developed. So the, that three-pronged strategy of minimum wage equivalent that includes expenses, tips, and transparency, we're asking you about those questions. You know, thus far, we've heard from Instacart workers in a group setting like this. We also are thinking about doing one-on-one -on -one interviews. So we wanna hear from workers and other platforms as well to see more about the similarities and the differences. And so we really wanna think about it holistically and get a really good feel for the problems that you're encountering. We also wanna know things like, what about wait time? So when we think about a minimum wage equivalent, what time does that cover? I think it's very straightforward to think about it covering when you accept a batch or accept a job and then you complete that job. But what about all of that time that you spend waiting? And is that something that a policy can address? We've learned from Instacart drivers that flexibility is the num one of the main reasons that you're working for this job. And at the same time, you're, you're basically tethered to a four hour shift or longer where you 
can't even leave a particular geographic zone without getting disciplined basically by by the platform and so we're looking at the whole picture of how workers are treated and so we're, we're trying to find out as much information as we can awesome that's great um, and then another question that i saw coming up a lot was about expenses so i think mm -hmm. expenses for gig workers sorry i'm still quiet i'm going to try to speak up um, i think expenses for for gig workers are pretty complicated um, and there's a lot of people bringing up various kinds of expenses that could be calculated. Um, and I know that one of the biggest expenses for a lot of gig workers is mileage. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, you know, how expenses could potentially be calculated and what it would mean for workers for expenses to be factored into their pay. Yeah, so we've done some research on this and we've learned that surprisingly and easily the mileage reimbursement rate that the IRS requires for employees, this year it's 58 cents a mile, actually does a great job of covering many, if not all of the expenses that are associated with driving. And so we know that for some work, there's going to be additional types of insurance or licenses that might be needed. And so we wanna find out about those. Uh, Mia has given us a really great spreadsheet of all of her expenses and all of her work and time. So that kind of information from me and from others is, is helpful. Uh, but as a baseline, the IRS mileage is, which will increase each year because the IRS is doing the work to calculate what the amount needs to be, does a really good first step job of covering a certain level of expenses. I also want to add that in your campaign to get rights for gig workers, there's the policy piece that perhaps can be turned into legal requirements. And then there's also the implementation piece. So the work doesn't stop with passing a law. And we know that all too well here in Seattle. We work with places around the country. So we work with New York City and San Francisco and Massachusetts and Los Angeles, other places that have very robust, strong labor standards offices. And after the law is in effect, then it has to hit the ground and businesses need to know about it and they need to follow it. So that's where outreach becomes really important offering these companies assistance with understanding the law and apply it. It's where enforcement becomes really important when workers believe that the law is not being followed and then there's penalties and then there's money that needs to go to the workers to make things right. And so just when you're thinking about this, uh, make sure to carry it all the way through with thinking about who's going to enforce this law and, and what does implementation actually mean. Totally. Um, so I think that was all the questions that I had for you. I'm seeing a ton of people in the chat who are saying that they would love to be part of this research and they would love to do interviews with you. So it sounds like we'll have some people to connect you to after the call. That's um, fantastic. You want to share about OLS or about this project? Excuse me? Is there anything else that you want to share about OLS or about this project? I'm going to, I'm going to turn to my, my unpictured colleagues here. No, I, I yeah, I think we've covered. I really appreciate the time. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Karina. Yeah. Um, so as you guys can tell from what this conversation has looked like so far, there's a lot of really important details to work through when it comes to trying to create new policies. The things that we're trying to do here are not, are not well-worn territory. The gig economy is new and it's great in a lot of ways and it's also really problematic in a lot of ways. And finding ways to address these workers' rights issues is going to take some creative thinking. Um, and it's going to take willingness to really dig into details of what these kinds of policies could look like. So just like Karina and her office are in the beginning st stages of doing research, we're in the beginning stages of going from having these big ideas to turning them into actual policy. Um, and there's going to be a lot of opportunities for you guys to be involved in that. A bunch of you have already brought up great stuff in the chat about potential concerns you have, things that you think that the companies might do in response to these kinds of laws. And those are all things we need to be thinking through as we think about how do we make a policy that really works for workers. Um, so we actually have a survey that we're gonna be sending out to you guys after this meeting. Um, and it's gonna be a pretty in-depth survey about your thoughts on various policy ideas um, and about how you think companies might respond and how you might be affected by various policy ideas. Um, and it's, it's really important that as we're working through these details that the people who are actually doing the work, which is you guys, um, are giving input on what you want it to be like. 
or what, sorry, what you want it to look like. Um, and, you know, if, if workers don't make their voices heard on these things, if you don't speak up, um, then we're in a situation where, like, politicians and CEOs are going to be figuring it out on their own. Um, and I think a much better situation is one in which you guys all have input in this process, too. Um, so we'll be sending that survey out after the call. Um, and I would love for you guys to take it and to share all of these really insightful thoughts that you have about what policies like this might mean for you. Um, so next up, we're going to hear from Joel. He is the founder of an app called Dumpling. Um, and it's a gig app that's sort of trying to do things a little bit differently. Uh, and Joel will be talking about how app companies actually can pay workers decently um, and what it would look like from an app perspective to follow these pay up demands. So go for it, Joel. Thanks, Emily. Um, so uh, again, my name is Joel and I'm one of the founders of Dumpling. And essentially what Dumpling is, is a platform for independent contractors or solo entrepreneurs to start and run their own grocery delivery services. So as Emily mentioned, she invited me to today to speak a little bit of it as an example of an app based comp uh, company that's kind of living in this gig space that's embracing and designing around some of the key tenants and demands that the pay up movement uh, is fighting for. Um, and kind of on a side note, you know, we first started working uh, with Instacart shoppers over two years ago. Um, and our big focus was trying to help advocate and shine a light on some of the more kind of ridiculous working conditions and issues that we're dealing with um, as independent contractors we're dealing with. So to fast forward two years and to see the impact that Emily and Sage and working in Washington and so many leaders uh, within the Instacart shopper uh, community and on this call have had is just a really amazing thing to see. So I'm, uh, it's, a, it's, it's awesome to be here and to be a part of this. Um, Ultimately, we decided that the best way that we could support the advocacy for this group was to develop a platform that addressed all of the issues that gig workers were facing and to do so through kind of a model of ownership. And so one of the big benefits of what we did is we got to spend a lot of time with, with Instacart shoppers across the country, um, people that work for different apps, really understanding what those challenges were, um, what was wrong with that, and to design a platform and a tool that would really kind of address those things. So those were kind of some of the things that I just wanted to briefly touch upon just to show that uh, it is something that can be done. Um, and so for us, there were kind of two key principles uh, that address some of the most widespread issues that independent contractors faced when working for on-demand apps. And, and so the number one for us uh, was being able to name your price and the conditions for accepting a job, period. Uh, full stop. Um, so as an independent contractor, by definition, you need to have the ability to set your price. And if you don't like my price, then maybe my service isn't the right fit for you. Um, and not only being able to set your price for the work that you're doing is important, but being able to do that in a way where you're not penalized for not accepting an order because it's too low or because you have to drive across town in the middle of rush hour and it's not worth your while and have to fear being deactivated. Um, so really, there's kind of two ways to do this. Um, the way that we decided to implement it um, was to let what we call business owners essentially set their minimum or uh, base delivery fee uh, for whether they wanted to earn on an order. And so essentially, this was their pay floor. And so um, no matter what their pay floor was, they didn't have to take an order uh, that didn't meet it. And, and the, the platform accepts that. So if a customer is not comfortable paying uh, what your pay floor is for an order, then, then the order doesn't come through. And, and certainly there's no um, repercussions for not wanting to accept an order that doesn't meet those conditions. Um, the second way I think is obviously what everyone's talking about here today. Um, and the reality is today that most gig workers don't have the ability to set their own prices. Um, and so really, I think what's so exciting about this group and this movement is the way to accomplish this is exactly what this means about is for everyone to come together um, to set industry wide standards and create the changes that we want to see and hold companies accountable. Um, I also think it's a really important side note that everyone's talked about um, where it's not just the $15 per hour pay floor, but that expenses are such a big part of this. And so it's really misleading. It's almost like a payday loan advance where we can lure you in with $15, but in reality, you're actually going to lose four or $5 because of your expenses. And so I think Karina mentioned the IRS deduction is a beautiful tool that, that captures a lot of that. And so it's really easy, I think, to make sure that when we're doing this pay floor and what we're advocating for, that it's the $15 after expenses. And so what that actually calculates and how apps can calculate that for you because they're all tracking exactly how far you're driving and where it's going. It's not a hard calculation then to figure out kind of what that, that should be. Um, the second thing 
um, that we heard a lot from, from gig workers across the country was there was really no way to benefit from your hard work and to build on that. So whether it was not having your tips and having them kind of count, uh, you know, towards something else or being stolen, um, that's a pretty demotivating way to, uh, to reward you for doing a good job. Um, or it was just not being able to actually kind of work with the same people that you're providing really good service for. It's, it's a very kind of demotivating thing not to be able to benefit from your work. And so, you know, if you think about kind of gig companies and, and, and startups, you know, they're all hyper focused on showing growth and showing and, and building customers for the future. Um, and oftentimes aren't thinking about what's the kind of the unit economics for this order. Because if I can get this person to come for a small amount, maybe it's a Snickers bar, um, then hopefully in the future, I'm going to be able to get them to place larger orders. And that's a fine business model. The problem happens is when the companies are actually subsidizing that business model on the back of their gig workers and independent contractors. And they do that by actually forcing you to accept orders that don't pay very well. And they force you to do that um, uh, in, in that way. And so really, again, I think there's two ways that this can be addressed. Uh, the way that we're doing it at Dumpling is through, again, this model of ownership where uh, you, obviously I think Matt, you, you alluded to it earlier. It's kind of crazy that it has to be a demand but obviously keeping your tips and having that be on top of uh, your base pay, I think is, is kind of a, an obvious one. Um, but I think the other one too is, hey, if you are gonna do the work and try to have a, um, a new person come onto your platform or do your service, then you also need to be able to benefit from that person when they decide that they wanna do another order in the future. And so the, uh, if you do a good service and they want to be able to order from you again and, and book your services, then they need to be able to do that and not to treat uh, gig workers and independent contractors, frankly, as kind of removable and interchangeable cogs in a machine. Um, so that's a big one is, is kind of that ownership and being able to work with the same people so that, again, you do a good job. They want to reorder from you. They want to give you bigger tips. All of that's good. I think, and the second one just comes back to the pay for. Um, so if a company wants to attract new customers by giving them a big discount and saying your first order is free, great, that's a great model, but the company needs to subsidize that, not the gig worker. And so uh, if, if they want to do that, that's great, but I think that's really where the pay for comes in. And so if you're getting, if we, you know, um, are able to, to achieve this goal and get the $15 after expenses pay floor, and they want to pay uh, workers to go and get that small order, that's great. And so I think those are really kind of the two things that we saw uh, encapsulate so many of the challenges that Instacart shoppers were facing and some of the things that we're trying to do to, to build a platform around that that kind of changes the dynamics of how that works. Okay, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kristen and she's going to be talking about the next steps forward and kind of what's going to happen over the next uh, few weeks. So Kristen, all yours. Hey, thank you, Joel. Um, yeah, so basically I know that we've talked about this. It's funny because the words have been stolen out of my mouth twice now. Um, the gig economy really, it's a new territory, you know, um, it's, it's just exploding. Um, and there's really not a whole lot of safeguards or standards in place to actually protect us as workers. Um, and we obviously are the workers that are on the call. So we've seen firsthand what happens when there's nothing in place to keep us from being mistreated. Um, you know, legislation, you know, that mandates that minimum pay plus transparency, um, it would just ensure that we're treated justly and we're paid a fair wage for what we do, whether it's full time or part time. Um, it doesn't matter why we do what we do. It matters that we're paid pretty much fair. Um, and I don't think anybody that's on this call wants anything extra. Um, you know, um, that's something that we get called out a lot on and we're not fighting for anything extra at all. Um, you know, companies, they can't do this to us um, if there's legislation that says they can't. And that's pretty much the way it's going to have to work. Um, we know that small groups of people have power, but the more of us that get on board, um, the, the bigger our voice is. Uh, you know, Mia was the one who put me in touch with Emily, um, you know, and so that was just one small way that I was connected to this movement, which I'm super passionate about because this is my full time job. This is how I make my living. You know, there's huge power numbers. That's just the end of the story to it. You know, there's so much public outcry against what's going on right now. And there's so much talk 
um, we're at a really key place, but at the same time, we're not at a place where we can keep just demanding and demanding and demanding. We just want to put forth our basic demands and bring people on board. And that's where really guys outreach is the most important thing. Um, you know, just so you know, there's a lot of next steps that I'm gonna talk about. You're gonna get an email with a link at the end. So you don't have to like look for it anywhere. Um, but you know, we want everybody to be signing up to the pay up campaign. Um, it's not just Instacart anymore. Um, I did Uber Eats for a while um, and I know about DoorDash because I signed up and didn't do it because of the tips thing. You know, um, signing up to the pay up campaign is literally the first thing you can do and it's the easiest thing that you can get anyone else to do. Um, I'm personally one of those people that just has to talk to every other shopper that I see when I'm not working. So it's one of those things where, you know, you just introduce yourself. If you see somebody Instacarting or if you're picking up a DoorDash, you know, delivery or something, you know each other, you know what it looks like, you know, just say hi, you know, um, hey, you know, how long have you been doing this? Do you know about this website? You know, just be friendly about it, obviously. A lot of people that are on their platforms right now, they're not as educated as they could be. Um, these companies do rely on people that don't know a lot about the platforms to do the work. And we all know that those new workers are the ones that take the orders and do the deliveries that hurt us in the long run. And um, it's not because they don't they're trying to do it to hurt us. They actually think they're getting a good deal and they're not, um, you know, but on top of that, guys, we're part of Facebook groups and that's great, but a large portion of shoppers, you know, Uber Eats drivers, you're not on here. They don't know us. Um, I can't tell you how many people I run into all the time that I invite to my local Facebook group because they just don't even know. They don't even think about it. Um, and so really local outreach, like you really have to talk to people when you see them. Um, it's not just people in within what you do. It's everybody um, in your local Facebook groups, um, posted on your personal page. I'm really active in my local community and you can bet that they have all seen posts about Instacart and the gig economy and working Washington. Um, so you wanna make sure as many people know about this as possible. Um, we, every gig worker should know about this um, because we're all being exploited in some sort of way. And so, once again, it's power in numbers. We have to make sure that enough of us get together. And one of the ways that we do that really is that Seattle is great. It started this wonderful, like huge campaign in this movement, but we need to build on that um, because what we're doing here could easily happen in other places. We want other people to step up as leaders for this um, and work in groups in your cities um, so that you know we can actually get things to happen. Um, it would be really exciting to make that happen because that's what brings us together nationally. The more cities that are doing this, the easier it is for us to connect um, to the people that really can impact that change for us. Um, so there's gonna be a policy survey. Um, basically what it is for those of you on the call that are super interested in how the policy can actually work, what it would look like, um, your thoughts on that. Um, you know, it would be really useful to have you fill out this survey. Um, it's really important that we all speak up and have input. There's so many great ideas floating around about how we can improve this. So we really would like as much input as we can from you guys as, as gig workers. Um, one of the things that I really believe in is the story builder. Um, we all do this for a reason and some of us do this for a reason that's not you know, ideal. Some of us, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. Um, but I can't tell you how impacted I was hearing another worker speak next to me to a legislative committee about being homeless because he could not make enough money to live um, working full time. He was living in his car and he was, he was doing DoorDash or Uber Eats or Lyft or something. Either way, it was heartbreaking to hear. Um, and you don't think about that, like we all are desensitized. So uh, we don't think about it sometimes until we actually have it in our faces. Um, and every story is different and you all have different perspectives and they're all really valid and they mean a lot. Um, it was like Mia's story caught the attention of somebody who actually was is interested now in changing things for us that wasn't before um, you know um, also there's a sign on uh, there's a letter that we have created that elected officials can sign on and for them to say that they support our goals I know I'm reading from a thing 
it's a lot. Um, it's too early to ask people to support specific policy. Um, we can't say you have to go in and change this law and make this happen right away. That's, we all know that that's just not how it works. We need to have those specifics nailed first, but we really want people to be signed on, to be part of our goal, because there doesn't have to be a specific policy in place to support what we are fighting for. Um, you know, we do have a web page set up with all the info on how to, um, oh gosh, here's a poll that comes up on my screen too, to contact your, your city and state legislature so you can contact them. Um, if you want to email your legislatures, uh, or legislature, legislators, um, make sure that you see the gig at workingwashington.org. Um, that way they can actually keep track and they can follow up too, um, so that we know how many people have been contacted. Um, you know, once, you know, if you have any other like ideas or anything you want to share about how we can like make this happen as a group, it's so important that you actually like take the time to send the information in, um, and that's gig at workinglaw.org. Um, you know, and once again, all of the links for all this stuff, it's going to be emailed to you. So, um, it's just going to be like the pay calculator and all the other stuff. It seems like a lot, but it really... It's not because we all have different roles. We all are comfortable doing different things. Um, you don't have to run up and talk to everybody you meet. You don't have to all write a letter to somebody, but you can do something. Um, and those are just some of the things that you could do. Um, there's lots of other things that we probably even haven't talked about that you could make happen. Um, you know, not, that's pretty much, you know, what I have to say, but you know, it's really guys, what it boils down to is just being paid a just wage for, for, for what we do. We're not asking for a lot. We want your support. It's just super important that we know you're here. Um, everybody on this call, you're already committed. I know all of you have done something or you're going to do something. It's who you can inspire to do something to help us, you know, cause we're helping each other here. Right. Anyway, I'm going to pass it back to you, Emily, to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, it was really great to hear from you on the different ways that people can get involved. Um, and like Kristen said, there's like, people have different strengths and different interests, and you should do the things that interest you. But we want to create a lot of different opportunities and a lot of different ways for you to be involved with this work. Um, because we know that all of you who are on this call, all 200 of you are really, really committed to this and really want to be a part of this fight and make these changes happen. And I think we can. Um, so I'll be getting an email out to you guys probably tomorrow with notes from this meeting and then the links to all of these things, um, the policy survey, the story builder so you can share your story um, and then we can share it out with the world um, and then the sign on, the info for the sign on that you can send to local legislators and a little bit of guidance on how you can send those emails to legislators um, to get them involved in the fight. Um, and look up the pay up campaign group on Facebook. Um, it's a small group right now, but all of you are welcome to join. It's a place that we can just connect with each other and talk about how we move this campaign forward. Um, and then I'll also be in touch with those of you who said you were interested in doing some kind of video Q and A. Um, I know it's like, it's really hard to keep up with the chat. So there's a lot of questions and great points that people brought up in the chat that we haven't had a chance to address. And I'm hoping if we can all get together on video and have a live conversation, it'll be a little bit easier to get into some of those details. Um, so if you have ideas about other things you'd like to do moving forward, please email gig at workinglaw.org. Um, and otherwise, be on the lookout for that email tomorrow. And it was so great to see all of you today. I'll see you all very soon. Bye.